Our co-host this morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. That loves pets. Loves the pets. Good with the dog, good with the cat. Goldfish. Maybe iguanas, too. I don't know. But not a raccoon. I saw one walking down the middle of the road this morning driving in. I don't like raccoons, but I was not about to get <laughs> get close to them. They can be tough. Oh, they can be tough. Badgers, like badgers. Not only tough, they're strong as can be. They, I, That's the last thing I want my dog to get in the fight with. That and the bobcat. <laughs> do you have or a lot skunk. Of, are there a lot of bobcats around here that I don't know about? Oh, yes, they do. Actually, they, are there a lot of bobcats yeah, there around? There's a recent study. They are, uh, they, are com- they are found in the eastern panhandle. You don't see them very much. They're nocturnal, and they mostly stay in the woods, but they're around. The skunk is what I don't want around. Yeah. There was there used to be for about ten years there was a skunk every spring that would come and set up shop <laughs> right by like our air exchange yeah. outside. It's and bad. it would just it would be worse inside the house than outside yeah. the house. Yeah. A couple of years ago we have a dog now that loves to catch skunks and he, she's caught two or three. That's a the, bad the, habit. Yeah. Last time we she caught one, she came back and we knew that she had one because she was frothing at the mouth because the skunk had actually sprayed her while the skunk was in the puppy's mouth. Mm-hmm. So we immediately took the dog home and gave her with the, the bath with the stuff chemicals you're supposed to use. And she was just as nice, smelled as nice as could be. And we looked at each other, Bonnie and I said, we won this battle until the dog opened her mouth and started breathing. <laughs> and then for the next two or three weeks, every time she opened her mouth, we had the skunk smell in the house. Well, that's a bad thing. Yeah, I had a an, uh, an issue with the skunk. I was driving to the gym in the morning, and the skunk was, there was a dead skunk in the middle of the road. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. But I didn't run over it, but I ran over top of it and i drive a car yes. that's very close to the ground <laughs> when i got home my son is like are you kidding yes how long is the i said i don't know he's like go to the car wash i'm like it's raining outside he's like i don't care you need to get that underbelly to it was a couple weeks because i same thing dug my me. heels in yeah. and said i'm not going to the car wash. you gotta wash that off right away yeah, you do. Our <laughs> next guest, Vanessa Therapy, is a candidate a candidate for magistrate. Must have gotten the memo because she has brought in a dozen Dunkin' Donuts, which you know those all dozen are there. Bill has not attacked them yet. Yeah, well, I started to, but Maria was going for them quicker than I could. So. No, I said we needed to keep the integrity of the whole dozen there so we can show it off. Until they've been introduced. And now, they've been now, introduced. We're, now we can now grab one. Now we can go whole hog, yeah. Vanessa, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You are a candidate for magistrate, and you've got quite the legal background, too. I do. Over 20 years as a paralegal. Yeah, you don't have to be a lawyer to be a magistrate. In fact, I don't think any of our magistrates are lawyers or attorneys, are they? Not not today. Yeah. Not at not. the moment. Uh, as but we I've, have had a number. Yeah, six months ago, we had a lawyer who yeah, was a magistrate. None of the current magistrate. ones, yeah. though, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. and you are a paralegal, though. Yes, sir. What's the difference between a paralegal and an attorney? What can you not do that you can do as an attorney? Well, I did not go to law school, mm-hmm. um, so I cannot represent anyone at hearings. Okay. That's about it. As a paralegal, what do you what do you know that I don't know, for instance? Uh, I babysit attorneys all day. <laughs> <laughs> my best man at my wedding was an attorney. Does that count? <laughs> um, so a lot of times what I do is I draft a lot of the discovery or the memos, motions. Sometimes I overstep and I do the memorandums of law mm-hmm. to assist the attorneys just so if it, there's an error or anything, they can correct it. But the majority of the work's done for them. Okay, very good. How long have you been a paralegal? Over 20 years. Over 20 years. And uh, you've also worked for a very uh, well-known attorney in this area as well, Mr. Yoder. Yes. Yeah, what was your experience with Mr. Yoder? Uh, Very nice guy, down to earth. Um, Very good for the citizens of the county. Um, I worked for him. He was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then he became a senator and then the judge. Mm-hmm. Judge Yoder, yeah. Uh, what other types of activities have you done in the law and in the community? Uh, well, before I moved to the area and got my education, I worked for the Maryland State Prison System. Mm-hmm. Um, completed the um, Police and Correctional Officer Training Academy and um, worked at the Mimin- Women's and Men's Prison in Jessup, Maryland. Okay, what did you do there? I was a CO. Okay. CO being a correctional official? Correctional officer, officer, yes, sir. And your volunteer activities? Uh, Volunteer, uh, I do a lot of things with substance abuse awareness. 
um, some community outreach for nursing homes um, and an advocate for domestic violence. Very good. And why do you want to be a magistrate? Um, I want to be a magistrate because I have a deep understanding of law. I have a passion for equal justice. I have my work experience, but I also have some personal experience that kind of pushed me to want to be a magistrate. What was that? Well, there was two. One was positive and one worked out to be positive. Um, one, I had to file a FPO and a petition for guardianship for my granddaughter. What's an FPO? Uh, family Protective Order. And um, I lost my son the end of December of 2022 and it was unexpected. And for my granddaughter's safety, I filed the FPO. And then I went in front of Judge Redding with a petition that I had drafted for guardianship, which was granted. So that was very positive. Mm -hmm. um, and then one time I was selling my mobile home and I got a letter when I got home from work on the door in crayon with my name that had a wrongful eviction hearing posted to it. And so I appeared in court and there was a magistrate that was appointed and I, she, I was there and she, I said, ma'am, um, I was not properly served. And she said, but you're here now, consider yourself served. And because I knew what the code was for proper service, I told her I didn't mean any disrespect, but she did not have subject matter jurisdiction over me. And so that did work in my favor because I knew, but had I not known, I'm not sure how it would have went. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Vanessa. And good thanks morning. for the donuts before uh, uh, before Maria and uh, and Rob gets them off. Uh, the, uh, so and, he tried to pawn those donuts off on us. We were like, we were going to eat them Yeah, <laughs> like he's the one who wants them, and now we're getting the grief for it. Yeah. Interviewing anybody that's running for office for a judicial seat, magistrate, circuit judge, whatever, is very difficult because there's only certain things you can talk about, many things you cannot talk about. Uh, so your background is one. Uh, what do you, in, in this case, you you have a contested seat, you and one of the other magistrates in uh, uh, in. Berkeley County, there's two contested seats out of, I think, the seven seven seats. Uh, what would you tell the folks of why that you're uniquely qualified over that of your of the individual you're running against? Well, from what I have learned, um, I do civil litigation defense for a firm that um, has four locations in the state of West Virginia. Um, I go to the trials with the attorneys. I help with the jury selection. I draft all the pretrial memorandums, uh, the voir dire, jury instructions. I draft all that. The attorney looks over it and then it's filed. So I have a good knowledge of like trials. And as a magistrate, one does have a right to a jury trial, even on the magistrate level. And so I think that puts me above some of the others. Um, I have experienced domestic uh, domestic relations, um, criminal defense, but mostly civil litigation. And I think that helps me stand out. Maria. So I think a lot of people may not recognize that, that the magistrate court is the first court, no matter where, what type of crime. So if it's a, you know, if it's even a, a murder in the first degree, it still starts in magistrate court. And um, lots of days, nights, weekends, and you're prepared for all of that, correct? Yes, ma'am, because I worked at the prison. And mm -hmm. when I worked there, I was on the emergency response team, mm -hmm. and I was a sharpshooter in three weapons. So even though I was assigned the 3 to 11 shift, I worked many times. Um, at one point when I worked there, we had riots, and I was there for over a week. Um, so I'm prepared to work all hours of the night. Yeah, I, I want to hear about the, you were there for a week at the prison during the riot. Tell me what that week was like. Uh, it was hell. Um, a lot of the um, prisoners there were moved from what was called um, the big house in the middle of the night to Jessup. All of them had three plus life sentences. Um, they had nothing to lose. There were uh, 12 officers either stabbed or thrown over tears. Um, and when I came in the house like a week later, 
I told my parents that I got my butt kicked for the first time in my life, but I walked through the door. And I think it was more terrifying for my family than it was for me. Did that ultimately lead to you leaving the CO field? Um, eventually, uh, it led to divorce. <laughs> and uh, my family had relocated up here. And so um, in 2002, as a single mom of two boys, I decided to relocate up here with my parents and worked in the tannery a little bit in accounting and inventory control. Mm -hmm. And then when that went out of the country, that was the time for me to go get my education. What is the greatest challenge facing the magistrates in Berkeley County? Um, I think that there's not enough consistency for magistrates. Consistent in what regard? Um, as far as like arraignments, um, they're all over the board. I've read the rules um, and it says that um, a magistrate has the ability to take a, um, if they're charged with, let's say, three or four crimes, the max fine amount and multiply that by three. Um, I've seen and heard of magistrates for someone, let's say, that under the influence, hit and run, leave the area for a while, return, turn themselves in, and get off on personal recognizances. Um, I work a lot with um, the police department and the task force, and I've been told that there are some people that get caught um, on I-81 with drugs, and the magistrate will let them out on their own personal recognizances. So I think that there's no consistency there. Okay, it's interesting. I was expecting you to say the workload because Berkeley County is getting a new magistrate, but we also, relative to other areas, the workload of the magistrates is, is totally out of the ballpark. So. The law firm that I work mm -hmm. for has over 100 attorneys, four locations, mm -hmm. and I work for all four of them. Mm -hmm. So the workload, that's nothing to me. It's, yeah. it's the inconsistency, I think. Mm -hmm. But can that be fixed by what? By the Supreme Court? By the uh, legislators? What would give you that level of consistency? Who, whose hand is that under? Well, I think if the legislatures and the Supreme Court come in and help with that, that would be great. However, you also have to take someone's prior history. Um, I know of someone who was charged with some felonies and went in front of the magistrate and the police officer pleaded with the magistrate to let him out on his own personal recognizances. He had never been in trouble before with the law, um, anything like that. And he said he was very respectful. And, you know, when I brought him in and the magistrate set his bail at like 60 some thousand dollars, um, three months later, it was everything was dismissed. So that gentleman had to post that bond. So I gather what you're saying, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, is that you feel them in a lot of cases the magistrate are being overly lenient. In yes. Front of, okay. Yes. And you intend to fix that? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> if I can. <laughs> so uh, obviously you have an extensive legal background, um, but the you know the demands for a magistrate, what the the basic um uh job description is it's a high school diploma maybe i think and not really a whole lot of legal background although we do see a lot of people who have either um, been in the court system are retiring from you know a particular um, a particular job but the the training and I understand there's training when you start as well. You don't just go in and say, here you go, have at. But, um, you know, but it is helpful. I'm thinking you think that you have this background. Yes, ma'am. I was amazed when I went to school and was told that basic requirements were B21 years of age, high school diploma or GED, no crimes of moral turpitude, no felonies. And I was like, really? So truck drivers or substitute teachers, they all require more training than a magistrate. Mm -hmm. I, it, it amazed me and I was like, wow, maybe one day I will be magistrate. Mm -hmm. Once I get the experience and the knowledge, I think maybe one day I will run because I was amazed by that. And why now? Because of the, um, the ability with a, another seat or um the avail the availability of another seat mm -hmm. i was the first person to file for pre-candidacy and candidacy 
for that seat. Um, that along with, I lost my son the end of December 22, and it kind of gave me the strength and the fight to actually go after my dreams and goals. Yeah, as a magistrate, uh, you you have the uh, the ability to set bail at very high, very low, or no bail at all. What considerations do you take in the place? What are the primary considerations? Uh, the risk of flight, or the severity of the crime, or the relationships with a larger group of people? What what do you take uh, the primary risk? I would take the risk of flight, the public safety, um, prior um, charges and um, their history. Um, and if a police officer that brought somebody in for an arraignment said he was the most rudest person I've ever met, he didn't follow instruction, that tells me that that person may not follow instructions to their bond. Yeah. So I think I would take that into consideration as well as the charges. Yeah. Uh our uh, prosecuting attorney, Katie uh, Delegati, has been very, I think, very successful uh, utilizing uh, the day reporting center and other alternatives as opposed to sending someone to jail. Uh, the individual, I think, has benefited. <coughs> the community has benefited by uh, utilization of these individuals. How would you approach uh, alternative sentences such as day reporting center? Well, I think everybody deserves a second chance. Um, but there are and I learned this when I worked at the prison. There are some that you can rehabilitate and there's some that we consider frequent flyers. And if you are a frequent flyer and we keep putting you at the day reporting center and you keep failing the drug test or not doing the things that are asked of you, then maybe at that point, incarceration needs to be incorporated. Now, do you have the capability as a magistrate, or I guess anyone going to jail, uh, that refers to the circuit as opposed to magistrate, is that correct? Can you send, can you send, some, send someone to, uh, uh, to penitentiary? No, sir. That has um, to go to the circuit. That has to yep. go to the circuit. Yeah, okay. But now, what is the limit of what you can do? You, I know you can refer someone to a grand jury, which in turn may or may not refer someone to the circuit judge. What level of, uh, of crimes do you have full control over? It's the misdemeanors, okay. um, the felonies. You may have, the as the magistrate, the preliminary hearings um, until it's bound over to the circuit court and the grand jury. But it's misdemeanors. I believe the fine is $500 and one up to one year, I think, in the jail. Okay. How about Child Protective Services? How much do you get involved with Child Protective Services? Um, well, one of the attorneys that I work for worked for Child Protective Services. So um, I'm big on thinking that the state needs to make every attorney uh, work in the abuse and neglect uh, field of law. Yeah. So I'm thinking about as a magistrate, are you involved in a lot of Child Protective Services? Um, probably initially, uh, maybe for family protective orders. Um, you're, a rep you're a mandatory reporter, mm -hmm. so um, if something's come in front of you, I'm sure you have to report that to Child Protective Services. Absolutely. So changing gears a little bit. So Vanessa, how do you get how do you get your word out? Obviously, by appearing on this wonderful show. But um, what are other um, ways that you're trying to get the message that? Um, that Vanessa is the best person to be magistrate. In well, state. Vanessa has volunteered in the community for many things, but she wasn't running for office, so she didn't advertise it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people out there that know that I'm a good person. They know that I'm educated and I have the experience. Um, I have my campaigns purchased some signs, doing a lot of meet and greets. I plan on knocking on a lot of doors and handing flyers and speaking to people um, just so they get to know me. Is this a four-year term? Yes, sir. Vanessa, would you, would you like to do it again if you're elected? Uh, I would like to retire from that. So, yes, probably five more. <laughs> and, five more terms. Term, <laughs> and I was just going to say, and it is nonpartisan as well, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. You, you've been around the legal system a lot from a couple of different angles. What advice do you give to people who are going in front of a judge or magistrate for the first time, and this is all new to them? Uh, be honest and have your facts because that's what I'm going to look at. I want the facts. I want unbiased facts. 
And as a magistrate, how, as you, as you would conduct a courtroom, what are some things that you'd like to implement that you haven't seen implemented? I would like equal justice in the courtroom for all parties. Don't we regardless, have that? We don't have that now? Regardless of their ability to have meaningful counsel. Um, because I feel like the prosecutors that come in and prosecute the case, they know the laws. And that's where I come in. I, I may not know all the laws, but I know where to find them and how to apply them. Mm -hmm. And so if someone comes in, the prosecutor may tell me what the law is. But I want to look at that and I want to know the meaning of the law, just so the defendant has the same opportunity as the prosecutor. And I know the the issue is that everyone deserves counsel, but do you have any sense of how many people who come before a magistrate are self-represented? Um, because I, I know in the circuit, generally on the civil side, there are people who are self-represented Right. Uh, I would say as far as the civil side, probably 80%. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the criminal side, I'm not sure on that, mm -hmm. um, but it does. it's income-based. Mm -hmm. And so if you are working but barely making it, mm -hmm. um, you're still going to be denied legal counsel. I'm sorry, say that again. I thought you, public defenders represented most everyone that needed support. No, needed sir. Help. You fill out an application and it goes by your income and your ability. And so most people fail that income parameter. Okay, so a lot of the folks that do not, that are denied public defenders representation is because of income. Yes, sir. I'm surprised that many people have, I, I'm surprised they have income that would warrant uh, denial of public defender. What is it, what's the cutoff, you have any idea? I do not know. Vanessa, if you go in front of a magistrate or, or a judge and you don't have legal representation for whatever reason, let's just say you can't afford it, but you make too much to get a public defender, mm -hmm. uh, is it the judge's or magistrate's responsibility to make sure you understand the law as you're going through this process? Or is it at that point, hey, you're unrepresented, every person for himself? No, I think it's up to the magistrate to know what the law is and to let that person know what the law is. Very good. Hey, uh, final minute, why don't you tell our audience why they should vote for you as magistrate? Well, I think I'm a good fit for the position. I have the knowledge and the experience, um, and I hope on May 14th, everybody goes out and votes Vanessa Faraby for magistrate seat seven. And how can they find out more about your qualifications? Um, they can find me on Facebook. I have a committee page on Facebook. Or What's it called? It's a committee for uh, Farabee Magistrate 2024. F E R R E B E E. Yes, sir. Right. Fair is in the name. <laughs> That's true. That's good. That might be a slogan right there. <laughs> Vanessa, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Thanks and for having me. Thank you for the donuts. You're it's uh, nine o'clock.